Hey guys, David Joniak here. Just wanted to give you some quick tips on the benchmark that's coming up this week, the 12 minute distance run. Later on in this video, I'm gonna give you guys the tools that you need in order to maximize your distance and obviously make sure that you finish feeling like you did what you wanted to and you didn't go too hard too early or you didn't save it all for the very end. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the basic things right now. Your 12 minute distance run is one of the five benchmarks of Orange Theory. So the 12 minute distance run is usually going to be the furthest towards the endurance side of that spectrum. So just like the 2000 meter row and the one mile, we're gonna wanna attack it in a very similar way. As I've been saying for years for my members and my friends, my colleagues, one pace wins the race. So what does that mean? Do we just wanna stay at one steady speed the whole time or do we wanna start slow and fast, start fast and slow or take intervals? I want you guys to think about a car, a vehicle. And this is how it's really easy to relate what we are used to with driving to our own bodies. So think about the engine and how a car consumes gas, how it uses its energy. All right, I wanna paint two scenarios for you. First off, we have a car that's going 60 miles per hour and it's traveling for one hour, all right? So by the end of that hour, how, hard, how far has it gone? 60 miles, all right? Trying to keep this really simple for you guys. And then we got another car doing the exact same thing. 60 miles in 60 minutes, so 60 miles per hour. Now grad, these are the averages of both these cars. All right, same car, same weight, everything. We're trying to make this as controlled of an experiment as possible. So the only difference between these two cars is one is going through stop and go traffic. All right, might be going up to 80 miles per hour, might be coming down to 40 miles per hour, but in the end, it's an average of 60 miles per hour. While the other car has just got it on cruise control, it's one straight road, no stop signs, maybe through the country, and it's going 60 miles per hour the entire time. Now, if we were to look at the fuel gauge or the fuel economy of both those cars, would we see a difference? Yes. Which one would consume less fuel and exert less energy? The answer is the one that keeps at one steady state. So I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this while you're driving with just fuel economy. And that's just how the engine works and that's how our hearts work as well. Every time that you shift gears in a car, every time you press down the, the gas pedal or every time you push down on the brake, every time you slow down or speed up, you're demanding more from that engine, all right? Because it's going to have that transition and transitions take energy. All right, just like any transition in life, right? So think about that with the body. When we increase the speed, it's not just going to use more energy at that higher speed, but that transition to build to that higher speed is also gonna take a toll on the heart. All right, so with that being said, even on the other side of the spectrum, when we slow down, yes, once we get to that slower pace, we're gonna be using less energy, but that shift is going to cause the body to react and it's going to use more energy as well, just like in a car. So that's what I'm talking about when we say one pace wins the race. You want one speed the entire time. Now, here's the dilemma. How do we know what speed that is? Well, first off, you have to collect data after data after data. All right, it's a lot easier to do on the treadmills than on the rowers because on the rowers, we're really only using those on average 10% of the workout. So there isn't too much data that we can gather to really have a good understanding of what our 2K pace should be, what our 500 meter pace should be, maybe our 200 as well. But the nice thing is we spend at least 20 minutes on the treadmills really every class. So you have plenty of time to gather that data and understand what my base pace is, what my push pace is, what my all out pace is. So use that data to best give you an understanding of what speed on average you should aim for for your 12 minute distance run. I'm gonna give you two more tips all right, very important tips. You know, first is how do I know if I'm a new member? All right, or maybe if I haven't been paying attention or maybe I just don't know how to use the data. And this is a really simple tool and something that I think everybody should really strive to work more towards, not just in the workout room, not just in Orange Theory, but in life. Don't overpromise and underachieve but under promise and overachieve. And I know I've been guilty of this plenty of times, not just with 
exercising and my expectations, but also, you know, maybe saying, hey, I want to, you know, go out and do all these things and I end up not doing them. So we're all guilty to some measurement, but bringing it back into the workout room. Think about how you feel when you overpromise and underdeliver. When you finish a workout that when you walked into the doors, you said, I'm going to get 12 splat points and you walked out and you only got six. All right. Or let's reverse that and say, I'm going to get six splat points and you get 12. The difference in how you feel mentally is night and day. And of course, back to the 12 minute distance run. If we say, Hey, I want to get at least a mile and a half and maybe you only hit a mile and a quarter. You're going to leave here feeling a little defeated thinking, man, what did I do wrong? But if you under promise and you're like, you know what? I just want to at least hit a mile and you get a little further than that. That's going to feel really, really good because not only did you achieve your goal, but you under promised, you over delivered and you know for a fact that you could have even gone further if you had had a better plan, a more accurate understanding of where that perfect pace would be. So you can use that data for your following distance run. How do I even guess a distance or a pace? And the answer is really simple. Pick a distance or a pace. They'll be two in the same that you know, 100% sure that you could maintain for 12 minutes and not 99% sure you want to be 100% certain, right? The cash is in the bag. I can hit this distance. I can hold this speed for 12 minutes. What if you finish that run and you know, you could have gone further. That's fine. You're going to at least have the knowledge knowing that one, you accomplish your goal and two, you could have gone above and beyond. Now this is going to be the last thing that I share with you guys. We want to make sure that we stick with the plan. Do not change the plan. You're going to go through a lot of different emotions and a lot of different physical states when you're going through this 12 minute distance run. And I like to break it into four quarters. And that's something that Olympic athletes, elite athletes, professional athletes all in the same do across the world with a number of different sports, whether it's running, rowing, skiing, biking, a lot of those endurance sports, they always break it down to four quarters. And so, we want to attack each quarter with a different mindset. All right. We want to be prepared for what our mind is going to go through because I'm sure you guys can relate to this. Usually when you're doing a benchmark or something where it's, you're asking your body to perform at 100%, it's not necessarily the body that's going through the most distress, but it's the mind because you're constantly fighting those voices that are saying, quit, give up go back to the drawing board, come back another day. It's not worth this pain. And that's something that everyone's going through. It's just a matter of controlling your emotions, not letting them get the best of you. And of course, having some strategies of how to redirect your mind to that positive thought process, to that positive mindset. And so I'm going to tell you guys how to do that. So first off with the first quarter, you're going to start off and you're going to have a false sense of confidence. The first three minutes, should not be hard. In fact, at some point in that three minutes, the first three minutes, you're going to be thinking to yourself, wow, this actually feels pretty easy. You know what? I'm going to change my race plan. I'm going to bump up my speed. False. You don't know how that speed is going to feel three minutes in well, six minutes in definitely not nine minutes in, but I guarantee it's not going to feel the same as it does at the start. Think about it like this, holding an all out for just one minute. Does it hurt the first 10 seconds? Probably not, but you know that by the last 10 seconds, you are screaming in your mind, bring me back to a walking recovery. And that's the same process that your body and your mind is going to go through on a 12 minute distance run. It's just going to be much more spread out, which is what makes those 12 minute distance runs so mentally tough. Now moving into the second quarter, this is where it's going to start feeling a little achy where you're going to start thinking, wow, this is definitely putting a toll on my body and my mind. And it's definitely going to feel more like a push. All right. Now that third quarter and a lot of you guys that have been following me for a while have been taking my classes and asking me for, you know, advice, especially on the rower know that that third quarter is the witching hour. 
something about that third quarter that not only is it very physically strenuous, but psychologically it just gets to us. I've done a lot of research on just the sports psychology of the third quarter and talked to a lot of incredible mentors that have coached athletes at the professional level and the Olympic level on talking about that third quarter of either running races, rowing races, football games, all that different stuff. And it's that third quarter, it just gets to us because we know we got half of it behind us, but then we also know that it's only halfway over. And we know how that body's feeling and it's already worn down. So it's really hard to ask yourself to maintain that speed for not only another quarter, but also a second half. So that third quarter is where we really need to get the sword and shield out and you gotta be the hero of your story. You need to make sure that you are ready to combat all the voices that are just raising up in your mind telling you that you're not good enough, telling you you aren't prepared enough, and telling you that you're not going to achieve it. All right, so just say things over in your mind. Say, I got this, say, I will. And here's the thing, a lot of people in this world unfortunately lack confidence. It's something I struggled with for the longest time and I still do. So how do you build confidence? There's many different ways, but my favorite way to put it is fake it till you make it. So how do I fake confidence? There is a building process to this. First, by telling yourself, I am confident. Now, that sounds really silly, right? If you're not a confident person, why would you tell yourself, I'm confident? When you start to say something to yourself about yourself, eventually you're going to start to believe it. And unfortunately, a lot of us experience that on the negative side of the spectrum. We send all this negative hate to ourselves and then we actually think that we are those words. So I want you to try to do the opposite, especially in this third quarter, minutes six to nine. All right, tell yourself I can, tell yourself I will. Just really short key phrases and keep saying it because you might say it once and then you're gonna forget it or that other voice is gonna tell you, nope, you're wrong, you can't. All right, so what do we do? We say it again. And here's the awesome thing that's gonna happen. When you keep saying something over and over again, it's repetition. Repetition is how you create habits. Now, if we continue a habit long enough, what does it eventually turn into? Personality. And when we practice a personality or when we have a personality long enough, what does that eventually turn into? Our identity. So if you just start by saying, I'm confident, I got this, I will, then eventually that repetition is gonna turn into habit. That habit's gonna turn into your personality and that personality is eventually, as long as we stay consistent, gonna turn into your identity and before you know it, it's gonna take some time, you're going to be a confident person that's able to say no to all those negative voices that pop up. So that brings me to the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter is where we can have some fun and we can rejoice knowing that it's almost over. Now, by law, the fourth quarter is going to be the most physically painful, but there's gonna be a little bit of weight lifted off your shoulders knowing, hey, I'm 75% done. So with that fourth quarter, just hang on. And one thing that I like to do is stay distracted, not constantly looking at the treadmill, looking at the clock, looking at the distance, but making sure that you're staying distracted from those things. We're not constantly looking into that because when we look at those numbers, time slows down. Am I right? What I like to do is I like to count my cadence, count my steps to make sure that I'm being most efficient. We want to make sure that we're taking about 160 to 180 steps every minute. Now that's a little obnoxious to count for 60 seconds and it's pretty darn high. So what I like to do is I count my steps for 15 seconds. And if you do some simple math, you should land about 40 to 45 times. Now of course, if you're outside that range, all we gotta do is get back in that range. How do we do that? By adjusting the speed of which we're pumping our arms. So let's say that you're pumping your arms this fast, but let's say I have to speed up. I would just pump my arms faster and that is automatically going to make the legs respond. Your arms dictate your shoulders, your shoulders dictate your hips, and your hips dictate your legs. So it all starts with the upper body when you're running. Now let's say that you're going too fast. All you do, is you slow down your arm pump and that's going to solve the problems. So that's one way to distract yourself. Another is just having a checklist going through your mind to make sure that you're being as efficient as possible. So one thing I like to do is I like to think, am I relaxing 
my hands, my wrists, because if you're tensing that up, it's not gonna help you. If anything, it's gonna hurt you because it's going to draw blood flow to unnecessary parts of the body where they could better be used in the legs, in the glutes. And then of course, make sure that you're relaxing all those extra face muscles. We like to make these faces whenever we get uncomfortable, right? That's directing blood flow up to the face that's just going to shoot you in the foot. We don't wanna do that. So relax the cheekbones, relax the forehead, and then of course focus on your breathing. Ask yourself, am I breathing deeply or am I breathing shallowly? We wanna make sure that we're getting those deep breaths in, in through the nose, out through the mouth. If you can, in and out through both, but it really takes a relaxed face in order to do that. That is my take on the 12 minute benchmark run. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I would love to hear some comments because I'd like to keep this interactive. I wanna know how you guys are doing on your goals. Either feel free to share your distance, how far you got, or give me some feedback. Let me know if these helped or maybe you already knew this and you want some new tips. So once again, good luck guys. And if you'd like to continue seeing videos like this uploaded, I'd really appreciate you guys considering subscribing. So you can just hit that subscribe button, give me a like below if you liked it. And then of course, I'll see you next time. Great job everybody, good luck.